I just want to uh, say how, how glad I am to be back at Brookhaven. And uh, it's a real honor uh, to be invited to give a lecture in this series. But it's especially um, nice to see so many old friends and colleagues. And um, Brookhaven is the place where I really got my start in science as, a, as, as an independent scientist. So uh, I'll always uh, remember the place with gratitude. Steve White and I started working actually here at Brookhaven uh, on, on the structures of these individual components. And in conjunction with these structures, people like Harry Noller and Richard Brimacombe uh, obtained information on where individual proteins would interact with ribosomal RNA uh, using biochemical techniques. And there were also NMR structures on, on pieces of, ri of these ribosomal RNAs. So pictures of the components were starting to uh, be built up over the years. And uh, Joachim Frank and Marin Van Heel developed single particle techniques on asymmetric objects to obtain increasingly detailed uh, electron microscopy structures uh, of the ribosome. And the hope was that by electron microscopy and uh, all of this biochemical information on knowing where the proteins were located, people could model uh, the ribosome. This was a sort of short-lived effort in the uh, mid to late 90s on combining these cryo-EM methods with, you know, these uh, localizations of proteins and biochemical information. And by the mid-90s, we had an idea of, of what the ribosome roughly looked like, and we knew that the 30S subunit bound the messenger RNA, and it presented the genetic information, and the 50S subunit was the subunit where the proteins were actually, the amino acids were actually linked up to form the protein polymer, which would emerge through this exit channel. And the tRNA is bound in the interior in between the 30S and the 50S. And we also knew there were three binding sites for these tRNAs. There was a one tRNA that held the peptide polymer chain, the protein chain that was growing, and that there was a new tRNA that would bring in each new tRNA. And then these tRNAs and mRNA had to move relative to the ribosome so that uh, the process could sort of continue and the protein chain uh, could keep growing. And uh, that's sort of shown schematically in cartoon form here. So you have the genetic information in mRNA as a template, and each triplet is recognized by a particular tRNA molecule that brings in an amino acid. And then a second tRNA molecule comes in, and then the 50S somehow catalyzes peptide bond formation, and then the whole assembly has to move so that now a new triplet is presented for a new tRNA, and then, uh, you know, the process sort of keeps continuing, and you can see how the amino acids are being linked together in the 50S. And what we want to understand is we want to understand this process in, in sort of mechanistic detail rather than just in this cartoon form. And one of the first uh, efforts in that direction was when the structure of this adapter molecule, this tRNA molecule, uh, was solved in the mid-70s by two groups, Alex Rich at uh, the American Cambridge and Aaron Klug in the uh, British Cambridge. And um, that's what it looks like. But, but the question was, um, how to go about uh, solving the structure of the whole ribosome. I, I thought I had a slide in here showing uh, how these crystals were made, but the first crystals of, of whole ribosomal subunits were actually obtained uh, by Ara Yonath and Wittmann and their colleagues uh, when they showed that entire 50S ribosomal subunits could be crystallized. And this was in 1980. And then Ara Yonath uh, worked over a period of 10 years to do two very significant things. One is she showed that the 50S ribosomal subunit could actually diffract to three angstroms resolution, which suggested that in principle at least an atomic structure could one day be obtained. And the other thing that she showed was 
Uh, people like Hoppe had shown that if you flash cooled crystals to liquid nitrogen temperatures, they would actually greatly extend their lifetime in the X-ray beam. And what Jonas uh, did was to quickly adopt this technique for ribosomes to show that diffraction from ribosomes would last much longer uh, if you cryocool these. So these were uh, very important um, contributions by Jonathan and her colleagues. Now a Russian group then also showed that you could crystallize the 30S subunit and the, and the, 50, and the sev whole 70S ribosome from Thermos thermophilus. But those crystals didn't diffract very well uh, when I uh, first entered this whole ribosome uh, crystallography field. Now the idea is that in macromolecular crystallography um, you need crystals and what you do is you, you, shot, you, you take your crystals and you put them in a loop which is then flash cooled to liquid nitrogen temperatures and you then hit them with an x-ray beam and uh, what the x-ray beam does is gives you diffraction spots because if you have crystals you reinforce uh, diffraction only uh, along certain orientations. And so this is what a typical diffraction pattern from a ribosome uh, looks like. And what you do is measure these intensities of these spots and uh, you need not only the intensity but you also need to solve the phase problem. That is you need to know uh, how to add up these spots in a Fourier reconstruction to generate uh, the object. In, in a Fourier synthesis. Now the normal way to solve a diffraction problem is to collect data on a crystal and then collect data on a heavy atom object, uh, on the crystal with heavy atoms that have been soaked in. Now an approach, ah, here it is, it's in the wrong order, I'm sorry. But this is just to show you the work of uh, Jonathan and Wittmann and their colleagues and then a group in, in Russia that crystallized the 30S and 70S and I've mentioned the cryocrystallography. And um, one of the things that we did when we started this project in Utah was to try to crystallize the 30S to high resolution. And after eight months, we were able to obtain crystals that also went uh, to beyond three angstroms resolution uh, of the 30S subunit. And this suggested that the 30S subunit 2 uh, would yield an atomic resolution structure. And when we went into it, the, these 30S crystals didn't diffract very well. But unbeknownst to us, uh, Jonath and her, her group also obtained 30S subunits that diffracted uh, almost uh, as well as our uh, crystals. The other thing you needed for solving these very large uh, complexes was a high intensity source of X-rays that are tunable. Uh, and so the thing that was essential for solving these large problems was the development of synchrotron radiation. And in fact, much of our early work uh, was done uh, right here at the NSLS at Brookhaven. Uh, our atomic structure uh, was actually uh, determined by data from two synchrotrons, the ESRF in Grenoble and the APS uh, near Chicago. And we've, we also use Daresbury to screen our crystals. So, so there's a kind of joke, which is you could join a ribosome lab and see the world. But uh, it's just as fraudulent as the Navy's um, advertisement because, uh, you know, in the Navy, you don't see the world. You see the inside of a ship or some, you know, uh, and, and thing. But, you, but really, it's, you see the world's synchrotrons. Anyway, uh, and, and this is what, what you join a ribosome lab to see, which is, uh, this is, for example, the X25 hutch at Brookhaven and, and the console as it existed uh, in, in the late 90s.